So welcome everyone to chat with an academy scientist. I have an animal care scientist or biologist here with me. This is Nicole Cheney. Hi everybody. Um, and you are an example of probably a kind of scientist that people probably expect to find here hmm. taking care of animals. Um, we do have quite a bit of research going on behind the scenes as well. And even part of your job is a little bit about kind of doing a little bit of a, a study of animals too, huh? Yeah, a study of animals in captivity, although you'll tend to find us more on the floor and visible to you guys than our research scientists because right. we have to go out there and feed and clean everything while you guys are here. Right. So give us an overview. Uh, what kind of animals do you usually work with? What do you do here? Um, my specialty is reptiles, amphibians, and bugs. But um, in the past couple of years, I've worked a lot more with the birds that we have at the academy. So in um, our rainforest exhibit, we have a collection of songbirds and also two macaws that you probably see perched out there. Um, I've worked with Lemon Drop, who's in our academy store. I've worked with um, all of our swamp animals and most of the reptiles and amphibians, either in the rainforest or down in the aquarium. Uh, that seems like a little bit of a dream job. Is anyone feeling kind of envious? Oh, yeah, I, I agree with that. I mean, maybe the snapping turtle seems a little dangerous to me. But um, <laughs> yeah, how did you get into this line of work? Um, you know, I've always been into frogs and toads when I was little. I'd go out and catch them in my backyard. And so I just kind of stuck with that and took jobs that um, would teach me about it. And here I am. This did was... you start pretty early? Oh, yeah. Like as soon as were... I could walk, I was <laughs> oh, okay. catching salamanders and toads in my backyard. And um, I actually... As a kid, this was my favorite place to come because they had so many reptiles and amphibians. Yeah. Monterey Bay Aquarium didn't have any. This place did. So, uh -huh. yeah. yeah. Anyone else out there in the same boat? <laughs> How many of you are like avid animal lovers? You go out and find them wherever you can. I yep. figure there might be some of you. <laughs> All right. But you mentioned that you are working in the rainforest now. Yeah. What's so special about this exhibit since you have the kind of inner circle knowledge of it. Yeah, well, um, it's definitely the only enclosed biosphere in San Francisco that I know of. Mm. Um, there are other rainforest exhibits uh, throughout the country and also in other European countries, but ours is the only one that I know of that actually has free flight birds mixed with uh, large freshwater fish mixed with live butterflies all in the same, wow. sharing, sharing the same space. Yeah, who's been to the rainforest so far today? Okay, if you haven't yet, definitely check it out. It's a pretty cool experience. It even feels like a rainforest. Oh, yeah. I yeah. think a lot of people are shocked the first time they go in of how hot and humid it is. Yeah, yeah. totally. And one of the best features that I think of whenever I go in there is, of course, the birds. Mm -hmm. um, these are pretty amazing colors. How many of you have gotten a chance to really take a look at them? Yeah. Yeah. Any ones that have really impressed you? Were there certain colors that you had seen? Yeah. Ooh, a bright blue one hmm. with a yellow breast. Which one do you think that one would be? Might have been the, the blue neck tanager. Ooh, yeah. Hmm. Oh, how about over here oh, you this, had one? This guy is a, a turquoise tanager. He has kind of a white color on his underside. Ah. Hmm. Okay. What yep. about over here? Yeah. What did you? Uh-huh. Ooh, a purple oh, and yellow yeah, one. Yeah, we're going to talk a lot about that one today. Okay. And how about over here? You saw the completely yellow one. Yep, that's our saffron finch. So if you're so used to working with uh, reptiles and amphibians, is it a little bit different working with birds? It is. Their, their whole life cycle is a lot faster paced than reptiles and amphibians. So you, um, you know, if something is a little off with the bird, if you're, you think it might not be feeling well, you have to act right then um, to get it feeling better. With reptiles and amphibians, their, their systems move much slower, so you have more of time yeah. to think about it and figure out a plan, whereas birds, you need to act right away. They sure. have a very high metabolism, so we feed them two to three times a day, whereas some reptiles, you know, they go a couple of weeks without eating. Like our anaconda, we feed it every three weeks. So yeah, and it's they're a lot more high maintenance than I can imagine. Are they are kind of finicky? Like, what kind of do they have personalities? Are they definitely personalities? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Tough to work with at all. Is there any bird drama going on right now? There's always a lot of bird drama um, with each other. You know, there's a lot of territoriality with each other. Um, there's a lot of aggression issues. We've kind of come to a stable point in our 
uh, songbird collection right now where nobody's really fighting with anybody else, but if we want to introduce one more bird or a couple of birds, it just throws off the whole balance uh. of everything. <laughs> we have to start over. Right. How many birds do you have? Right now we have 21 birds okay. in there and 11 species. Wow. And I mean, it must be kind of hard to keep track of them. So yes. any guesses? How can we tell, how can we keep track of all of our birds? Just based on this, you can probably guess. <laughs> yeah? Binoculars are an important one. Very important, yeah. Do you have like a special binocular technique? I don't, actually. Oh, okay. It's, it's, I, I use my, I have really good eyesight, so most of the time I don't need to use my binoculars, but every now and again, okay. something's going, you know, something's up and All right. need to take a closer look. Other ideas? How about back here? The, yep. the bands, right? The little yep. bracelets on their legs. Yep. I have a whole, um, this is my little bird banding kit. So I have all kinds of different sizes and all kinds of different colors, and even the different colors have numbers on them. Can we pass those around? Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, that'd be, hopefully, we don't want to contaminate anything, but it'd probably be okay. Excellent. So normally, um, <laughs> is that just like a pretty loose band? How do you uh, no, put it on there? No, it's actually very tight yeah. fitting. So if this is my little bird leg right here, I'm going to demonstrate on this. This is my little collection of bands. So I'm going to demonstrate on this, actually. There's a little metal spatula, and you take your band, and you put it on the spatula until it's kind of open. And then this is your bird leg. You just take the, let's see, there we go. So take the that, spatula. Put your thumb on it, and you pull the spatula away. Oh, and then your so it's like a, a shoehorn almost? Yep. So it makes, makes it open yeah. wide enough you can put the bird's leg in there. And you have to then, be really careful because, yeah. um, you know, you can't slip or anything because you don't end up injuring the bird's leg. So you just got to be very careful and not shaky at all. Do they get pretty <laughs> mad with you when you try to ban them? They get a little upset, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, can, I can imagine. But, of course, you do some very nice things for them like feeding. Yes. Um, we actually have some examples of some bird food with us today. Mm -hmm. I'm going to pass around. What are we looking at here? This is, um, we feed them three different types of pellets. One's called insectivore, which is the stuff. This one here. Um, all of our tanagers in the rainforest eat lives, live insects as part of their diet, and this diet, the insectivore diet, helps supplement that. And then we have soft bill pellets, old. which is what Sonia has I wouldn't right recommend there. smelling them, actually. <laughs> um, Sonia has our soft bill pellet. And then there's also what's called small bird yeah, maintenance, which around. provides them all of the vitamins and nutrition that they need. In addition to the pelleted diet, they get um, fresh, organic roots and veggies every day. They probably eat a healthier diet than I do. Um, and we feed them two to three times a day. So because they're all kind of flying around freely as much as they like, is it hard to tell if they're all eating what they should? Um, yeah. You know, every day when we do our health checks, we're looking at the condition of the bird. So if, if a bird is not coming down to feed, that's, that's definitely an alarming yeah. thing. Um, like I said, they're very high metabolism, so if they don't eat a couple meals, they're going to be in trouble. Uh -huh. So we make sure everything's coming down to eat, everything right. looks of good weight. So you you yeah. are the eagle eye, though. You're out there Definitely. on the railings with your binoculars or not, because yes. you have very good eyesight, yes, as you exactly. mentioned, <laughs> um, looking around, seeing if the one's looking scraggly. or Exactly, yeah. Okay. Oh, and they also eat um, a nectar, which we give to them in these red cups. And is that, that's pretty similar to what they're doing in the, the rainforest. Are they yep. feeding out of uh, flowers? Flowers, yep. Um, fallen fruit, right, underripe fruit, overripe fruit, all of that. Yeah. yeah. Now, you mentioned that they, uh, some of them are insectivores. Mm -hmm. uh, well, they have live insects as part of their diet. Okay. Yeah. I was going to ask if some of them eat the butterflies sometimes. That does happen, particularly um, if a bird or a bird pair is nesting. They need more protein during that time. So uh -huh. if they're not getting exactly what they need from us, they want a little bit more variety. Sometimes they do take the butterflies, but it's just a few here and there. Okay, yeah. so we don't have to worry too much. You have a question already? <laughs> yeah. What? Oh, the white oh, plate here? Yeah, what is the white this, plate for? This would act, that was actually really early on, right near um, when the aquarium opened, and we were experimenting with different food dishes that would work with our butterflies and also our birds. And the, the sad fact was that the a lot of the butterflies were drowning in this presentation oh, no. of food. So that's when we switched over to the red cups, and we float these little Petri dishes in there that act as little rafts so that the butterflies oh, don't drown. Cool. <laughs> so learning through experience yes. is very, try, try very important. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, now, part of learning through experience that I think is pretty exciting is we have successfully bred some of these birds. Right. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, you saw this yep, one. That's Excellent. the Violacea siphonia. And the male, the boy, is this bright, uh, pur dark purple and yellow color. And the girl is kind of like an olive green color. Yep, that's the female. That's the male. Um, here's a picture of the male feeding a chick in a nest. And um, this is one of four other species that we've successfully bred in the rainforest. Now, is that pretty common to be able to breed these in captivity? Not at all. These are really rare birds. Um, not very many people outside of aquariums and zoos keep these. And so it's quite an achievement to just get them to breed, let alone produce yeah, healthy chicks. I'm sure. Yeah. Did you have a question? Uh, yeah. So do the, the mother and father feed the babies? Yeah. Um, in some species, only the, the mom will uh, sit on the nest, but all of the species that we currently have, both the dad and the mom feed the, chi feed the chicks after they hatch. Yeah, so it's yeah. a pretty good sign that we have a, a nice rainforest habitat going, mm -hmm. that we actually have these guys breeding. What, what makes them so comfortable? Because this, if this is a rare thing, there right. must be things that that you consider that make them a lot more comfortable to actually breed here? Yeah, for the w first thing is the intensity of the lighting and also the, the light cycles. So we mimic the natural environment. Um, the lights stay on longer in the spring and summer, mm. shorter in the winter. There's lots of misting systems in there, so that mimics um, you know humidity and rain, and, and they really like uh, that. Okay. Um, but the main thing is all of the live plants that we have in there, especially the planted walls that our horticulture department has put together. So you'll see a lot of those on um, actually all of the levels of the rainforest. They really, really like these. They like to burrow into the sides of them, nest in there. We actually have one active nest right now on the third floor of the rainforest nice. in the planted wall. It's at the very top. Really hard to see because it's just this little hole in the wall, uh -huh. basically, um, that they put together. And you have a bird nest with you I do, right yeah. here. I can't pass this around, but I'll pull it out so you guys can see. this tiny wow, little nest. really little. And About they'll, it's mainly palm fiber. Um, sometimes they'll use human hair, which is kind of gross. Um, <laughs> little leaves and stuff like that. Little dust bunnies that they find. And some of them even go and get spider webs, which is cool. Oh. Yeah, to, to bind it all together. So using whatever it is. I actually saw some this morning. I was looking around and I saw some picking up some little fibers. Yeah. Yep. Do you have a question? Oh, yeah. oh yeah, so I'm glad that you asked that. What is this image here? Yeah, so that's a little egg. And just to give you an idea, um, this is about the average size that those birds in there would lay. Some oh, of them wow. are even smaller than this. And what you see there is um, we're doing something called candling the egg, which is shining a really bright light into it and checking if it's fertile. So when we hold up the light in a, and we're in a dark room, we can shine that in there and see if there's any blood vessels, if there's any yolk, see if the egg is actually developing. And that's important for us to, to know so that we can see if we're going to be expecting chicks or not. Um, as you've noticed, there's a big open pool at the bottom. And so when it comes time for the chicks to leave the nest, if that pool isn't covered, they might land in the pool and the fish might Ah, uh, okay. So, so it's important for us to know exactly what's going on at all times. <laughs> we can cover the pool with a net and then that's not a problem. Yeah. And what kinds of things do you think you could find birds doing to clue you in to their breeding. What do you think you might find birds doing so you know? Yeah. So males and females hanging out together? Mm -hmm. Yeah, what else might you expect? Yeah, what do you think? Oh. Yep. So you might see some more, like, they might fight a little like bit more. aggression. Yeah, mm -hmm. yep. totally. Ah, bringing yep. different things to the same spots. That's a big one. Yeah. So what are, what are your key indicators? Um, first, courtship. If the male is constantly singing and dancing for the female. Oh. Um, sometimes he'll present her with various objects trying to show off. So sometimes our um, little banana keats, which you had on an earlier picture, the one with the stripe on their head, they'll bring a leaf to the female and flap their wings oh. and do a little dance. That was good. That's try do you, and win do you her have, affection. Do you have the dance worked I out? I don't. No, Just no, the wing flapping. I'm not going to know. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm known for doing a lot of dancing in my program, so... <laughs> I guess I'll let you off the hook for this one. Yeah, so um, <laughs> that's, our, that's our first cue. The other one is bringing, um, collecting all kinds of nesting material and bringing it to a specific location. So we're always looking for that. Um, and another one is aggression. If birds are 
actively trying to fight with other birds, keeping them out of a certain area, that could tell us that they're either establishing a territory or nesting. Yeah. Do they ever, um, sometimes I'll go through a parking lot and one of those little black starlings will come over and like oh, dive, dive bomb dive your head. Bomb. Do they ever do that in the um, rainforest? Not, our birds aren't too aggressive, so I haven't had that. Okay. Yeah. So far, so good. <laughs> yeah. Question. If they get aggressive at us, it hasn't happened. Um, the species that we have aren't really that aggressive towards people. That's and that's good because we have yeah. a lot of guests walking through there. Yeah, <laughs> that's certainly important. Did you have a question over here? Yeah. Oh, okay. Just stretching. So my, my next question for you, you mentioned that it's really important for, um, for us to take precautions to make sure that those birds are really safe. So what are some of the other things that we, we do to make sure that those babies Yeah, um, sometimes are safe? we will, um, at, when it comes time to, for the babies to leave the nest, sometimes we'll actually capture the whole family and put them in our, this is our typical off exhibit setup. Um, in this case, we weren't sure, we had never bred the Violaceous euphonium before and we weren't sure how they were gonna behave in that space. Oh, um, thank you. So we captured the whole family right when they were getting ready to leave the nest, put them in this cage on um, the Madagascar level of rainforest just to keep everybody safe, yeah. make sure we raised everybody. And we got uh, three nice looking chicks out of it. Nice. Yeah. Very nice. And it looks like they're all kind of a little curious. And yeah. And they, uh, this particular species, they all hatch out with the female coloration. And then over time, the males will develop that really bright plumage. Yeah. How do you catch them when you when you go to try to find them and bring them into this That's area? That's a good question. Um, in the case of these guys, we just kind of put a net over the nest. And like this one? Yeah. This is my little net. Little ah, net. a little bird-sized net. Um, it's very small. So we could put this over the nest. And then the adults we capture using a catch cage. So it's very Bugs Bunny style. Oh. Um, we have a little cage in there that we feed them in every day. We just leave the door open typically. But if we want to catch them, we have a little rope that closes the door. Oh. So it'll be about 10 feet away. And when the birds go in, we just close the door. That's really yeah. sneaky. They're just, <laughs> yeah, it's, we're going to be in the cage every day. Oh, yeah, yeah food, delicious. And some, some of the smarter birds, they'll recognize us. So oh. um, we might have to change our shirts and uh, look like a member of the public. I so see. that they aren't suspicious. Interesting. <laughs> Question, yeah. Do the butterflies and the birds ever fight? Yeah. Um, sometimes when the birds are at their food dishes, you'll see butterflies kind of doing this, flying at them and getting in their face. Wow. Um, and sometimes, like I mentioned before, uh, around nesting time, the birds will, or yeah, the birds will eat the butterflies, but it's very occasionally. Mm. Well, it's all the circle we of have life, lots, right? But, yeah, circle yeah. of life, natural behavior. And that is that is really important that we have this sort of circle of life. These birds are pretty important out in the wild, too, as those insect eaters, as right. seed dispersers. So what are we learning from this process? Are we sharing this information about how to do the best job with other institutions, too? Definitely. Like I said, these birds are really rare, even in zoos and aquariums in the United States. So we're sharing every aspect of what we're learning, their life cycle, how long it takes to incubate the eggs, what yeah. nesting sites they prefer with other zoos and aquariums. Yeah. And we're actually sharing some of the offspring with them as well. Um, we have shared, I think, sent out nine babies this year to other zoos and aquariums for breeding programs. So it seems like it really fits in with uh, the mission of the academy where it's... Um, Oh, gosh, our mission. It's explore, explain, and sustain life. And obviously, right. you're taking care of these animals, but um, making sure that we have the best ways to take care of them and right. not take them out of the wild as well. Exactly. Which yeah. is really cool. Well, are there any other questions for Nicole? Yeah. So what yeah. other information comes from the bands? So we'll... Um when we band a bird, we'll band it either on the right or the left. So that'll tell us the individual. But um, the number is recorded on that bird's individual history sheet. So that if we happen to have, you know, five birds of the same color, when we capture that bird, we can tell exactly what individual it is. Yeah. yeah. And that's it. It seems like it'd be really hard to tell them apart. Are there other ways to tell them apart besides the wing bands? Yeah. Or the, um, the little bands on you their know, legs? different, slightly different colorations, certain behaviors. Yeah. I, Rarely actually have to look at the band, but occasionally it does yeah. happen. Yeah. <laughs> Do we have another question over here? Yeah. Oh, do the birds fall in the water sometimes? We take care so that doesn't happen. It is possible, but we make sure to put nets over the pool so that doesn't happen, especially yeah. with the baby birds. Yeah, you may actually see that from time to time when you come to the academy. You'll see a net stretched over the top of that pond yeah. there where all the big fish are. 
Yeah. And that's a pretty good indicator that there are some nesting birds around, huh? Right, yeah. If you see that net up, you'll know now that that's why it's up. <laughs> so what is your favorite part of the job? That'll be my last question for you. I would say um, walking around in the morning and just kind of watching all their natural behaviors before um, everybody comes in. Because they're, right now, with a lot of people in there, they tend to hang up at ha hang out at the very top. Um, and you have a great view for of them from the third level of the rainforest. But before everybody comes in, they're all over, they're doing all these cool behaviors, and I think that's my favorite part, yeah. Excellent. Well, are there any other questions? Yeah. Yes, yeah, we have some babies that we like to keep, um, but often we're trying to create a really diverse bloodline of that particular species, so we'll send them to other institutions and maybe do a trade. Yeah, but there are some in there that were bred here. Mm -hmm. Right. We have um, something called a species survival plan with a lot of our animals like right. that, making sure that their captive populations are very diverse. Our penguins our are penguins, an example. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, do we have other animals that we breed here also? Um, yeah, we do a lot of amphibian breeding. So a lot of the frogs you see in the rainforest, they're not part of a species survival plan, but they do have a registered stud book through the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. So oh. again, we're ensuring that um, genetic diversity so we can sustain a capi captive population. Did you say stud book? Yeah, stud book. Stud book? Mm -hmm. like, like horse registry, like dog registry. Okay, like that frog is a stud. <laughs> Very cool. All yeah. right, well. Oh, another question, yes. Okay, so in a real rainforest, yeah. in an area that size, is it going to be more birds or less birds in that kind of area? That's a good question. It, it would just depend on that particular plot of property. If there's um, really good resources like a berry tree or something, you're going to find way more birds in that area. And if it's kind of barren and not a lot of stuff going on, you'll find less. So uh, it just depends on the quality of that particular patch of land. Right, kind of like our populations. All the cities are near all the resources, the jobs. Like and where, you know, one block has a lot of restaurants, there'll be a lot of people. Right. Oh, totally. Okay, and over here? Mm -hmm. Have That's you a been question. in a real rainforest? I have. I've been down to Peru and Costa Rica and El Salvador. And it is a lot hotter than our rainforest, actually. <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> a lot more bugs, a lot hotter, but really, really beautiful. Lots of cool things yeah. to look at. Yeah. Oh, and one last one. Yeah. Peru, I Where was mainly Peru? up in the highlands. Yeah. So it was a, um, a temperate rainforest, not, not as hot, high elevation. Okay, yeah. Cool. Yeah. So you saw a lot of fro dart frogs, did you? Okay. It's a, it's a really well-known place to see dart frogs. You yeah. can, I can tell you're pretty excited about frogs, right? <laughs> oh, awesome. Oh, yeah. Cool. Very cool. Very cool. Very well, cool. that's all part of what we do here. <laughs> we go out and explore. We also explore how things are bred here. Um, and that's all just part of the explore, explain, and sustain life. Right. So can we give a big round of applause to Nicole for coming out? Thanks, everyone. <laughs> and thank you all for being here and supporting the Academy. <clears throat> we wouldn't be here without you, so thank you so much. And enjoy the rest of your day. If you have any other questions, if you want to come up and check out some of these props, come on over. We'd be happy to talk to you. But if not, thank you so much, and goodbye for now.